Hi everyone, this is Claudia Tristan, an immigration advocate, and you're listening to BS Podcast. Mi bandera, lo grito por donde quiera, mexicano 100%, no existe ni una barrera. Mucho menos no se para una frontera con papel o sin papeles, yo vivo a mi manera. No me importa en cualquier país. Si el celo se pone negro, gris. Escuchando a Gerardo Ortiz, celebrando fiestas patrias con dos Genesis. Cantamos mariachi y en acapela, miramos a diario con los jefes, la pinche novela. Hola amigos de Pancho Villas Army, aquí en Sargento with another episode of Villas Podcast. Today is episode, if I'm correct, 61. Uh, and we're excited because today me and Coronel are going to get some dirty secrets and dirty information on one of our favorite members here of TVA, actually our, our founding member. But uh, before we go into our guest, Coronel, how are you? How is life, my friend? Hi, how you doing, man? Great to be back. Uh, it's another... Another beautiful day here in Phoenix, Arizona. It looks like it's going to be hot, but, uh, you know, I guess we're ready for it. We, we could get snow, right? I think it was raining in Texas, so man, we could use a little rain, but we're, other than that, it's great. It's great here. Raining in Texas, I think Chicago and some of the northern places were getting snow uh, this week, and that's like, really? It's almost May, but it, it, it's, it's whatever, right? We don't have to worry about that here. We just worry about... Uh, you know, we can bake cookies in our car and we can fry <laughs> eggs in, in the sidewalk. Uh, the sidewalk, yep. <laughs> so um, enough of that, Coronel. I thank you for, again, coming along. Let's go ahead and introduce our guest. And you know what? Um, I haven't had the pleasure of knowing our guest very long. I've, you know, connected with her via social media. Um, and again, really, I mean, amazing, amazing person that we're going to meet today. But Coronel, you have some more interaction. Would you mind doing the introduction? Absolutely, guys. Well, welcome to the show close personal friend of ours, of mine, I should say. I think I've probably known her maybe one week later than Serge. So, because I've known her since 2013. Uh, again, welcome to the show, Claudia Tristan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I love that jersey, it looks great. I know, isn't it great? I was just telling you guys um, earlier that I got this for my birthday earlier this month. It was like my gift to myself. Nice, so. nice. I remember, I remember those uh, those tweets, those birthday tweets, and the birthday. Yeah. You sent out. How you doing, man? It's great. It's been such a, while, a long time since I've seen you. How's everything going? I know that's my fault too, because I haven't gone out to many games. But everything's good. I I can't complain. I mean, in a pandemic world, I really can't complain. That's true. That's definitely true. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say your jersey matches my background, so I don't know. I think I have the wrong jersey. I should. Yeah, yeah, you should have coordinated better. <laughs> But uh, no, hey, Claude, nice to finally meet you as well. I mean, no, we've been connecting via, you know, social media and, you mm -hmm. know, of course, you know, you follow your brother, PVA, and all of us as well. And there's always that connection. Uh, but, um, you know, first of all, I just want to apologize from all the PVA members that, you know, I just feel bad that you have, you know, Serge as your big brother. I mean, <laughs> I, can, I can imagine uh, it must not be easy growing up with uh, Serge, you know, in your childhood or maybe even now. Uh, yeah, still definitely not easy. He is quite the character. I definitely, like, when you think of Big Brother, like, and everything that comes with it, and, like, being overprotective, being a bully, picking on you, like, Sergio's photo should be in the dictionary for that, because he, like, just checks everything <laughs> off the list as far as what you would imagine a Big Brother to be. But uh, overall, he's okay. He's cool. I have to say that so that I can still get tickets now and then, right? Okay. Um, so on the record, I think he's a great big brother. Wink, there wink. <laughs> and, and again, at any time, Claudia, if you need us, if you need help or anything, just give us a sign and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll blink us. twice. <laughs> blink twice. Let us know if there's any time you feel that you need us to come and save you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claudia, if you need us to to share any kind of memes, we've got a book of stack like this high of memes of surge that we can we can forward to you and you can bully him back okay. oh i definitely need that arsenal of memes please we i didn't know that existed yeah we got no we got them ready they're ready for any any moment <laughs> any event <laughs> any holiday what you name it we got it <laughs> got it okay okay i'll keep that in mind then <laughs> cool. so, so, Claudia, tell us a little bit about yourself um so again just kind of tell us this is a, you know origin story so you know where were you born raised you know were you uh, you know, from originally from Texas. So anything is, is that you want to share with us about yourself? Yeah, so born here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I lived here till I was 13. And then I had to move overseas with my dad's work. Uh, he worked for the government. Um, and it's crazy because he's 
an immigrant, Mexican immigrant, right? Um, but then he makes it through the military ranks and also makes it through State Department and we get assigned overseas representing the U.S. Um, while still being technically, you know, still carrying our Mexican culture and our Mexican heritage with us. So quite the experience. You're kind of definitely caught in two worlds, plus the third world of where you're living overseas. Um, and then I came back to the States about 10 years ago to start college. So I guess that aged me. I, I'm 30. Um, and so, yeah, I've been in the U.S. now 10 years and just moved all over Texas, moved also to New Mexico, um, Illinois, D.C., New York. Uh, I just move around a lot because that's just the way we grew up once my dad started getting assigned overseas. So Sergio is my big brother. And I think that's that's like one title that I carry, not like my biggest title. But, yeah, he's a big brother. And uh, he grew up here in Austin, you know, through through high school and then stayed here for college. And then I was, him and I are about 10 years apart. So that's why I still had to move with my parents overseas once they got assigned over there. Okay. You know, I didn't, I didn't realize it though, because 10 years is kind of a large gap, right? Typically yeah. siblings, right? Wow. So Serge is older than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> He's been misleading you guys. And I'm here to set the record straight. He is 10 <laughs> years older than me. Uh, yeah. But you know, Mexican families, we've got, a lot of kids, it was five kids in my family. My little sister and I were the two youngest ones and we have seven years apart. Um, so it's like my brother was 16, 17 when she was born. So yeah, you know how it is. You got kids kind of spread across decades sometimes. Wow, that's interesting. Well, that's, pretty, that's super cool. You know, that's, uh, you know, five five kids. That's a big family. Yeah. And then, yeah. you have to have those years gap. That's like... That's 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 different to be honest with you because normally it's one right after the other, and you're or there's usually what max like a two year gap in between siblings, right? But, right, right, right. I think some of us were definitely a surprise. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I would say like even with Serge and I being uh, ten years apart, I'd say we're the closest ones in our family. So. Oh, cool. Still okay. didn't affect us in any way. <laughs> So like, why do you think it, it was that you and Serge were the closest? Is it just uh, because of your, you know, you guys had common interest or uh, do you know why that was? I think it's because los dos somos enojones. Like we both have ese carácter. Um, <laughs> so we would always like team up together when like if I would get in trouble, he'd defend me. And if he got in trouble, I would defend him. And we just both have like a very, very similar personalities and like we're just like, we have an attitude, you know, we have a carácter fuerte. So I think it's just that our, our personalities matched um, among the kids. Cool. Well, that sounds pretty cool. So when you when you started, so when I first met you, it was 2013. Mm -hmm. You came out to Phoenix. Um, I think it was 2013, right? 2013, 2014. That's 2014, I think. Spring spring 2014. Yeah, you guys came out for the U.S.-Mexico game. Mm -hmm. And if my memory serves me correct, that's the only Mexico game you've ever been to since then. <laughs> Lies, first of all. Um, I, I, regr say, I regret to inform you that I have been to a few more Mexico games. I went to a Mexico um, Ecuador game, I think later that summer in Dallas. I went to the Gold Cup final two years ago in Chicago. And in between that, I think that's it. So, but, but, so I have only been to like two, three games. Recent, yeah, yeah. I, I guess since we since we met, yeah. Yeah, a, a little bit. So a little bit of backstory for those of you guys who don't know. I mean, we've got like this inside joke that um, obviously we travel to all the Mexico games. Um, close personal friend of ours, Wieso Vasquez. We all just kind of travel together and, and and we meet up. They got into this surge and and Wieso got into this thing where they wanted to take a picture of all three of you guys, like Claudia, Sergio, and Wieso. Well, Claudia wouldn't be present at a particular game, so Wieso and and Sergio would 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 pose for a picture like they're like they're hugging an imaginary Claudia, right? So it's every time they do a game, they they take this picture and they blast her on social media. She didn't get a chance to make the game, so you know how we got, you know how we do it. Yeah. So we we're constantly bullying, we're constantly uh, teasing her about it and stuff like that. But uh, for those of you who don't know the background on that, uh, what, what what do you think about that, Claudia? I mean, it's funny. It's I think it's funny. Obviously, y'all are just teasing and playing around. Um, I've had coworkers. There was one time. What was it? Spring 2019. I was supposed to go to a game. 
Um, but I had just started working in the governor's office. And so you're working for a, gov a state governor. Like it's, it's a big, there's a lot of work, you know, and there's a lot of schedule changes that you sometimes can't control. And so I had bought my, my game tickets for that Mexico game. I can't remember where it was. I think it was like in Dallas or something. I was going to come out to the game. Um, it was like early May. And just because of work and the situation that was happening on the border, I could not leave my office. And so I had to cancel. And then all of my coworkers started seeing y'all's tweets online and they come over and they're like, are you okay? Like your brothers are really, and they thought all of y'all were my brothers. They're like, your brothers are really coming after you on social media. And I was like, I know I was supposed to be at the game, but obviously there's like these things happening at the border. So I can't leave. And so like I canceled my trip and they were like, oh, well, like, that's just funny. You know, they thought it was hilarious. Um, and it's, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I take it in stride. No, I mean, you're a good sport for that, for sure. I mean, I can just imagine, you know, having to deal with that. But. I mean, 30 years of surge as my big brother has prepared me for the teasing and bullying from multiple big brothers. I feel like he counts for 10 with everything he's put me through. Yeah, no, I totally get it. No, you know what, Claudia, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about, you know, your kind of backstory regarding what you've been working on, right? So mm -hmm. um, I know that Serge, you know, he's definitely very big in, um, you know, in, in law and doing many, many, many things, right? With PVA, he has so many things. But tell us about your background regarding your career. I mean, you definitely didn't take your, your typical path that maybe like a lot of parents probably expect us to take, right? Yeah, I mean, growing up with immigrant parents, they obviously expect you to become a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. And Sergio, as the oldest, um, you know, they they always go more strict on the oldest kid, right? So he definitely took the path of lawyer. But I was the fourth out of five ch children, so I, I had a little more freedom in what I wanted to do and study. And so I chose journalism. It was a passion of mine since I was fifteen. And so I started off in television journalism. I helped establish a Telemundo TV station in Abilene, Texas. And then I moved to Lubbock to work for Telemundo and Fox uh, there, the Fox affiliate. And then from there, I also covered Telemundo New Mexico as well. And then I moved to El Paso and I went straight to English news. I was only doing English news in El Paso for the CBS and the Fox affiliate. And that's really when I like sunk my teeth into the whole immigration border, um, border like sphere of everything that's going on in regards to immigration in our country. And that was also the first two years of Trump's presidency. So if you even just somewhat or very little listen to the news, I'm sure you've heard about immigration issues over the last four or five years, uh, particularly under Trump. I mean, it's come up on multiple headlines. So to some extent, I'm sure people know that there have been a lot, there's been a lot of activity in regards to immigration and the border. So I was there on the border reporting on immigration issues during Trump's first two years in office. And then I got a call from the governor's office of New Mexico. Um, and she was about to start her, her, her term as governor. And so they had called me up to go and work for her. And I said, yeah, of course. And I was also uh, the more experienced person in regards to issues about the border and immigration, uh, aside from the governor herself, obviously. And so I did a lot of border immigration issues for her office uh, while also working as her press secretary. And wow. then from there, I've just been in politics since then. Wow, that's, a, that's, that's crazy how you go from one thing and then it jumps into something else. Yeah. yeah. And, and I yeah. saw that, I was like, I had to reread your, your, your post because I remember you did mention that you were making the move. And I was like, am I reading this correctly? Like, is she really like working for the governor? And I thought that was like super cool, man, like super cool. Yeah, I had never thought about leaving journalism. Like it was definitely, and it still is a passion of mine, but it's also a very tough industry uh, to work in as a woman, as a woman of color, um, especially if you're in television. And so um, I had thought about taking a little break mm -hmm. and, you know, my work contract at the TV station was almost up. And then when a governor's office calls you saying, we want to hire you, 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 it's hard to say no, you know, yeah. those are opportunities that aren't very common. Um, and so, yeah, I, I took the interview and I said yes once they made an offer and yeah, I just packed up my car and my dog and we left. That is so cool, Claudia. I mean, just the fact that you went one path, you know, you, it sounds like you found a passion, right? You saw that there was something that really just, you felt connected with, like, I want to make a difference here or 
I see that there's some injustice going on mm -hmm. that I want to bring more awareness to, it sounds like, right? Um, yeah. But before we, we you dive in, because I mean, after that, you didn't stop there, right? We also saw you doing a lot more after the, the governor's office there in New, Mex in New Mexico. But right. uh, there was, uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, and, and I caught my attention, you, you definitely saw a lot of either injustice or not a lot of equality or or challenges that you dealt with being you know being um of color and a woman and, and all these things mm -hmm. but there was a video that you have in your twitter that even talks about the pronunciation pronunciation of el paso and um i'm gonna play it really quick and if you don't mind just uh, after we show it just kind of tell us how this got started or, or really just give us a backstory if you don't mind so mm -hmm. let's just play it first and then we'll talk about it reporting live in downtown el paso claudia tristan from you back to good morning el paso Hi everyone, Claudia Tristan out here at City of El Paso Animal Services. An employee of the El Paso County. You know, everyone has their preference on how they like words to be pronounced. I prefer if the word has Spanish origins to pronounce it with a Spanish accent. That's just my personal preference and that's how I'm going to continue doing my job out here. Uh, where the El Paso police have already taken El Paso by storm. I am still in downtown El Paso. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that, Claudia. So definitely interesting. I mean, a lot of us can connect with that, right? Especially I mean, being in, in California and Arizona, there's a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of, you know, Spanish origin, you know, names in our cities and our towns and everything. Um, and I definitely have seen that. I've been I've been I've been, uh, you know, called out on that. And I'm just like, what? So tell us about it. Uh, so yeah, if you've been called out about it, I think you should be as authentic as possible and as true as possible to the name and the origins of the cities you're in. So good on you for working to pronounce those uh, names correctly in Spanish. But for me, I mean, like I mentioned, being a Latina in news, it was tough. It was definitely tough, uh, especially coming from a bilingual background where I work for Telemundo and um and english stations like the fox and cbs affiliates so it was definitely a, a tough time for me when i was getting comments about my pronunciation of the city which to me was a little crazy um the fact that we are in a bilingual border town and that people are somehow offended or upset that i am saying el paso as el paso versus el paso I am lucky enough to be bilingual because my parents worked really hard on making sure that we grew up speaking Spanish. And to say El Paso instead of El Paso, the true name, is not only disrespectful to the history of that community, but it's disrespectful to the work that my parents have put in to make sure that we keep up um, our culture and our language. And I just couldn't imagine you know, saying it in English. Like to me, it was never even like a debate or a conversation um, that I had internally or anything. It was just like, oh yeah, I'm moving to El Paso. I now live in El Paso. I'm, you know, right now live from downtown El Paso. You know, we're at the uh, stadium in, in East Side El Paso, like whatever it's to me, it was always just El Paso. I never had like some sort of internal dialogue or internal battle about like, should I pronounce it in English? Should I pronounce it in Spanish? It's like, no, like it's just, it's natural like that. And as we continue to have these conversations, I'm realizing that it's it's also a way to honor the history of that location by being as authentic um, as possible. Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of, uh, and I commend you for that, I mean, awesome, awesome. The the one thing that we forget is, well, the entire Southwest is like that. You know, you got mm -hmm. Los Angeles, Los Angeles, right? Santa Clara, mm -hmm. you know, Santa Clara, right? But for yeah. some people to come out and say, to get offended because of the way you're pronouncing something, I mean, that should be the least of it, right? It, it really, yeah. we got other things that we got to worry about than, than you know, pronouncing uh, Las Vegas or Las Vegas or whatever, right? Whatever mm -hmm. it would be. Um, that's when I was kind of blown away by it. It's kind of taken back. Like, really? Like, are, are people really that... Offended? <laughs> like, you know, like, really that offended? Like, yeah. like, do they really think that El Paso is... El Paso, like, do, do they really, do they not know? And it's just, it goes to education, right? And just, you right. Know. But I'm I mean, the erasure of our history, uh -huh. um, you know, because Texas, like much of the Southwest was originally Mexico, Mexico. And, you know, for them to get so offended that I'm just honoring the history there 
And, you know, I, it, it makes no sense to me. Like, and it doesn't bother me if someone wants to say El Paso or El Paso. But I think if you're bilingual and you have the skills to be able to pronounce it correctly, why not normalize that? Yeah. Why are we normalizing this anglicized version of our communities or of our own names? Like, I always say I'm Claudia Tristan. I'm never going to tell you my name is Claudia Tristan because that's not my name. That's not what my parents named me. My name is Claudia Tristan. And if you have the capacity to be bilingual and to have these skills, why not be as true to yourself and, you know, really help uplift the history of the area that you're in? So, like, so it's funny you it's funny you mentioned that about the names because mm-hmm. this when you're talking about this, I'm thinking about my dad, right? So my dad was in construction for many, many years, right? His entire life basically. His name is Ezequiel. Mm. And his his bosses, his co work well, mostly his bosses, they couldn't pronounce Ezequiel. So they go, We're just gonna call you Isaac. And then my dad was like, Whatever, my dad didn't care. He just wanted to mm-hmm. work. So and I was like I was like, they just did they just rename you? You know, mm-hmm. because they couldn't pronounce it again. Yeah. You know, I kind of had a little issue with that. He it didn't really seem to bother him. He just did whatever, right? But um, and to this day, everyone knows him as Isaac. They renamed it because they couldn't pronounce it again, right? So it's like when you're talking about that, that's the first thing that pops into my head. You know, it's like oh. and they, well, and that doesn't just happen with us. I mean, it happens with a lot of Asian Americans in our country as well, who then have to adopt an anglicized name. Because mm-hmm. God forbid any of us make a little extra effort to learn how to properly pronounce it. Ooh. I mean, you know, if you're willing to make the effort, even if you don't get it right, I 100% appreciate you willing to make the effort to try to get it right. Because you are then respecting me and my culture and the way that I pronounce my own name. And you're being, and I'm being true to my identity. So, like, I don't care if you say it wrong, but if you... If you hear that I'm saying it Claudia Tristan, or if you hear I'm saying it El, uh, El Paso, then I appreciate you 10 times more for even just making an effort to pronounce it correctly. So yeah, you can still get it totally wrong, and that's fine, but make yeah. the effort. But to, your, to the point, yeah, I think a lot of it too, right, is just that, you know, it's, it's both ways too, right? Because I also see sometimes in our community when somebody, like even our own, our own, right? Like, you know, you have folks that were born here and have, you know, maybe they didn't, they weren't, they didn't grow up bilingual, and mm-hmm. they say something wrong. People also like kind of give them dirty looks like, why, why did you say that? So it's like we have to like, you know, understand each other, right? Like, hey, right. they weren't they probably weren't taught that that was the right pronunciation. But to our point, we, maybe it's our turn to educate them or, or maybe let them know, hey, oh, actually, you know what? It's actually pronounced this. Did you know that? Do it in a way where it's not attacking them or belittling them mm-hmm. or kind of give them that dirty look. It's more like, oh, OK, well, you know what? It, um, did you know that the origin or whatever? Right. Just some way to communicate that and, 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 and you know, help each other out. Um, well, and to that point, I mean, several, it, first of all, there's a history or studies that are have been done. If you've already been here by the third generation, if you're the third generation of your family, the chances of you speaking Spanish or your family's native language are very, very slim as it is. But because of the history that we also have throughout the country and particularly in the Southwest, I mean, in public schools here in Texas, they would have beat you. The teachers would have beat you for speaking Spanish in the classroom. So, of course, those kids then grew up to have children and told their children, never speak Spanish. You will never learn Spanish. I never want to teach you Spanish so that you are never caught in the classroom speaking Spanish, so that you're never bullied, so that the teacher never reprimands you or kicks you out of class because you said something in Spanish. And so there is also a huge fear that has just been passed down from generation to generation um, that has erased the Spanish language as well for some families that have been here much longer. Well, that's, that's a great call out. And again, this is why it's a big testament to, you know, you standing up, right? And, and, and it, it, it takes us, right, to, to stand up for those things, to keep mm-hmm. that alive so it doesn't get erased, you know, and, it, and it'll right. rename us, you know, and, and to forget about our, our history. And this is like every different culture in, in, you know, race here in the U.S., right? It's always that, that, you know, it just starts to get eliminated over time. And we don't mm-hmm. want that. We want, this is what makes us so wonderful, you know, in this country. So good right. call. Yeah, for sure. So you, so you work, so going back to what you working for the government, uh, the governor's office, I thought that was super cool. Right. Yeah. And that was in, in Nuevo Mexico, right? In, yep. in Santa uh, Fe. Mm-hmm. Oh, Santa Fe. San, Santa Fe. That's right. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. So let me oh, ask you. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. <laughs> no, no. My, my thing was El Paso. Do you consider El Paso part of Texas or New Mexico? Because a lot of people 
consider they don't consider El Paso Texas. I, I did not know that. Dude. I know it's horrible. It's really bad when te when people think of Texas, they totally forget um, El Paso. Yeah. And honestly, that's. A his the part of Texas that's just been going on for ages. I mean, when you look at funding that they get from the state, El Paso is always the last. Um, so, you know, El Paso is even forgotten by our own Texas state government. Uh, so, of course, outsiders are also going to be like, oh, yeah, I forgot El Paso is right there. But I, so I had never been to El Paso before I got my job there. Uh, I had been there once for a wedding real quick for the weekend, but I had never, like, spent any significant amount of time there. And I have said this multiple times. I have lived in many different countries and cities all around the world, Europe, Africa, South Asia, US, uh, or North America, if we're going by continents. Uh, I've lived everywhere. And there is something about El Paso that you will not see anywhere else. And I can't confirm if that is just because it is on the border and that all border communities are like that. But El Paso truly has something like really beautiful about it. And I just can't put my finger on it. But I know like for me specifically, what was really impactful was that for the first time ever in my life, when I was in El Paso, I never once felt like an outsider. And so you're, you're talking to me, right? A, a little Mexican girl, Texican um, who lived in Greece and obviously stood out because I didn't speak Greek. I lived in Botswana. And obviously, because of the color of my skin, I didn't uh, fit in. I obviously stood out. Um, I lived in South Asia. And again, I'm a Latina in South Asia. So I stand out a little bit. People were always confused. They were like, are you Indian? Are you Sri Lankan? Are you mixed? You know, half German, half Sri Lankan. Um, and I was like, nope, I'm, you know, just Mexican. And so El Paso for me was really like the first time ever. I never once felt like an outsider and I could speak Spanish without feeling like anyone was looking at me because like over there, like you walk up to the register at any business, any restaurant, grocery store, and everyone speaks Spanish and you can just like start chatting with them in Spanish. And I was like, ah, this is amazing. I've never had access to this, this much Spanish because growing overseas, the only people who spoke Spanish usually were like my mom and my dad. And so we would just speak Spanish amongst ourselves. And so for me, El Paso was just like, uh, it was like a homecoming to a home I never had. I never knew that existed. I love El Paso. And yeah. I hate that it gets discarded so much by our government and by our state. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I never really thought about it, but we do have pockets like that in different cities. So here in Phoenix, mm -hmm. there, there's a certain pocket of, of in the city where you go there and it's basically everybody speaks Spanish. The market, kind of city, uh, everything, everything, everybody speaks Spanish there. And you kind of, when I, and you're right, you know, I never really thought about that. When you're there, you kind of feel almost like, kind of relaxed, right? A little bit, yes. Like kind of like home, right? It's 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 really unique. So I think all cities pretty much have that. We just never really think about it, dude. I yeah, feel, I mean, I feel like I feel weird because I don't have a carniceria here, dude. I'm like, where's the carniceria? Where's I'm, I'm like, and then I go to, you know, go to the South Phoenix, and I'm like. I'm 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 hoarding stuff. I'm like I'm taking this. I'm taking this. I'm I'm stocking for the month, uh, because dude, it's it you just feel so you know you feel like you're missing out on so much of your mm -hmm. of your food, your culture, um, traditions. I mean, it's just it's a big difference, man, for sure. And you you totally nailed it. Pockets, and you feel yeah. comfortable. You don't feel like your people are looking at you and staring at you like what, you know, you don't uh, you know you kind of stand out. You're not from here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey Claudia, so let me ask you this. Another thing I've, I've been, I, I kind of was trying to figure out how to how to ask this or how to bring this in, but I'm just gonna jump right into this. <laughs> uh oh. Just uh -oh. recently, no, just just recently, you were on a Zoom call with Nancy Pelosi, right? I was, yeah. Yeah. With so the speaker, la, as my grandma would call her, La Pelosi. <laughs> yeah, La Pelosi. I, mean, I was like, when I saw it, I woke up. I'm, I woke up and I'm like. What? Like, am I like hallucinating? What? Like, what's going on? And obviously, do you care? Would you care to share that story? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so the organization that I work for right now is called Moms Rising or Mamas Con Poder. And we focus on several different issue areas. I specifically work on immigration, but we also have different areas about child care, health care, uh, maternal justice, criminal justice. I mean, a bunch of different areas that our organization covers. And so we were having a press conference with Speaker Pelosi to celebrate um, that the Paycheck Fairness Act, which is a bill in Congress right now, um, had actually passed the House. So that means it got enough votes to pass the House. 
And now that bill is going to go to the Senate. And if it passes the Senate, then it goes to President Biden's desk and he will sign it into law. And essentially it requires um, it helps enforce gender equality um, in in the workforce, especially in regards to our paychecks, which I have unfortunately been a victim of. As I mentioned, um, the industry is not good for um, for women of color, for people of color. And so I unfortunately faced gender pay discrimination. I was uh, working with a few years of experience already under my belt. I uh, also had two bachelor's degrees. I had a master's degree. I'm also bilingual, which has been an asset in every single office I have worked in. And most offices will pay more if you are fully bilingual, which I am because I speak, read and write it um, fluently and professionally. And yet I found out after I left that particular job and workplace, which I won't mention specifically, I found out after I left that a male colleague who had just graduated from college had been making $6,000 more a year than I had been making while I was at the same office and we had the same job title and the same job duties. So uh, I was mad. I, I was very upset when I found out. I tried to take legal action, but because of the timing and the fact that I found out after I left that office, um, I was unable to do anything legally about it. And so I've, I've basically been silenced until now. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's. I mean, you don't. We don't think about that, right? We don't really think about it because we've always been taught to kind of, you know, we never discuss paychecks, so we never discuss mm -hmm. how make it because it could even be a conflict. You know, your coworkers, right, could be like, wait a minute, he's getting paid more than me, but I do more work than him, right? Mm -hmm. But but now, you know, we're talking about obviously you were obviously qualified, you had everything, more experience and all that stuff, and then to find out that someone was getting paid for more because they were male, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no other excuse for it. He he didn't have more experience. He didn't have more degrees. He didn't have more skills. Uh, there, there's literally no other excuse other than the fact that he was a man and I was a woman and a woman of color. Right. Um, and so that's it's frustrating and it's so disappointing to see. And like you said, you know, especially as Latinos, you know, we're just not like, oh, work hard, keep your head down, and you'll be rewarded. You know, that's what we're always told. Um, so that we don't make a ruckus. And I think that time has come to an end mm -hmm. and it's time to make a ruckus and to be loud and to demand what you're worth. And I get really frustrated when people are like, oh, well, you're bilingual. Like, do you mind helping me with this, this and this? And I'm like, are you going to pay me more? My right. salary does not does not consider the fact that I'm bilingual. So I am not actually going to help you with this bilingual item that you need help with. Uh, because my salary didn't didn't include that, and so I don't bring that skill to the desk if I'm not being paid for it. Claus, that's, that that happens a lot. Do I hear this mm -hmm. from many people, right? That work even in retail, right? And and, mm -hmm. and they always talk about, oh, you know, growing up, it's it's gonna be such a benefit. But it's like a lot of folks, including myself and many others, like I'm waiting for that benefit. Like, what 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 yeah. am I gonna get paid more? What's going? Oh, you get twenty five more cents. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, but to your point, man, you know, I, I totally agree with you. You know, a lot of times we're just happy we had a job, happy that mm -hmm. we are employed. But like to your point, those times have changed, right? A lot of this is coming coming forward and we're starting to be more visible to it. And, and it's time for us to step up. You know, one of the things that I teach a lot of folks is, you know, is negotiate, you know, negotiate. Yep. Don't always like take the first offer. It, it, and it's and it's uncomfortable, you know, and it's something that maybe we weren't taught in our culture to negotiate. Just like, OK, yeah, you know, you want me. Great. But it's like, do you really want me? OK, well, show me how much you want. You want me. Right. right. Uh, and it, the, the, the worst thing that can happen is that they'll meet you halfway. Right. They might not give you what you wanted, but at least they got you more. Right. And mm -hmm. um, the first time that happened to me, I was I was like, I was like, oh, my gosh, it, it, it worked. Like, oh, my. OK, cool. They listened to me. Um, they realize the value that you bring. And, and, you know, we are really valuable. You know, we have so much value that we can bring. So definitely something to take away if you if you're if you're listening. Right. Um, you know, just. You know, stand up, have a voice. Could be uncomfortable at first, but uh, you know, it's time for us to speak up. So thank you, Claudia, yeah. for being there. Well, and not just um, to your point, Rich, as well. What you had said about um, talking about our salaries. You know, I did negotiate for a better pay at that job before I signed my contract, mm -hmm. um, and I did get a bump. I got a two thousand dollar bump. Uh, so I was making, and mind you, at that point, I was only making with that bump. I was making thirty four thousand dollars a year, and I was making it work for me. Um, 
And then uh, to your point, Rich, about sharing salaries, I think we should do that more often and we shouldn't be ashamed. And I always made a point of sharing my salary, even with other people um, in other offices and other uh, workplaces. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, I'm making this right now. Um, these and these are my skills and whatever, whatever. And so like, I, I'm not ashamed to share my salary. I think I've earned my salary now at this point. And if anything, I learned from that experience that I should have shared my salary with my coworkers much earlier so that we all could have learned and seen what had happened uh, and see what was happening. Man, and so, uh, cause like salaries were, were seen as taboo, right? It's still kind of seen as taboo. Right. You don't speak about it. You don't speak. Well, about and it. bosses will threaten you if you speak about it. And I had been threatened um, to not share our salaries. And then even when I did go public, telling my story about being a victim of gender pay discrimination, then my male coworker, former coworker, chose to threaten us um, for speaking out. And I said, what? Uh -huh. you, you, this is your chance to be an ally and this is your chance to support us. We're not saying you don't deserve your salary. Right. We're saying that we also deserve that salary. We as women deserve to be making equal pay for equal work. Yeah, like 100%. it's that basic you know what? that's kind of that's kind of scary you know that's kind of scary that they would threaten right mm -hmm. uh there, there's different different degrees right but the fact it's almost like and i don't want to get too crazy and, and way off topic but it could be almost like uh something close to sexual harassment right because you know in in the workplace it's where most of well, obviously where most of it happens you know there's a little bit of if there's a little bit of sexual harassment, there's also threats of you can lose your job. Uh, I will tell your spouse about it or whatever. Right? Yeah. Oh, oh, you know, but the, the threatening part is what scares me uh, that you do mention that yeah. people feel it's OK to threaten. Right. Because right. it's not so right. right. It point, scares that, people into silence, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, really, again, it's, it's, it's the power, right? It's the power mm -hmm. struggle. As yeah. Whoever has a power and abuse of power, right? And that, that you see that in many levels, whether it's pay, whether it's, you know, sexual harassment, whether it's even, you know, just threats, you know, keeping people, you know, doing less for more yeah. and, and paying others who are doing, you know, less and getting paid more. You know, it's like, how is that right. equal? And I think we see that, you know, transition into sports, right? We're seeing that too, right? And this is why yeah. I love what Pancho Villa Army is all about too, is that, we're not, you know, we're not seen in, in our in our mission is not to be seen as a good old boys club, right? We're, we want everybody. It's a family environment. We support the women's soccer. We want to make sure to be advocates and a voice for that as well and continue to support them. So I feel like, you know what, is these kind of conversations and us speaking about it and sharing our stories that, you know, is going to start making that difference and not, not not holding back, right? Not being ashamed of it and, and not making it continue making it a taboo thing. It's like, no, let's talk about it. Right. This, this exactly. I'm glad we need more. We need more people like you. Uh, <laughs> will speak up, right, and stand up yeah. for what they believe is right. Because we you know a lot of times, especially being Mexican, Mexican American, you kind of did I say something? Should I not say something? Am I out of place? Mm -hmm. We're always kind of like we're always scared because of for whatever reason, right. uh, or number of reasons I should say. But you know, we need people to stand up that. Stand up for us, right? That's and I guess you need to, to be, again, a sister of Serge. I mean, you yeah. have to spend <laughs> your, life, your life to speak up and defend yourself with him. All yeah. that teasing finally paid off, all his bullying. <laughs> don't, don't, just keep it down. We don't want to give him a big head still. We want right, head. right, right. <laughs> but um, let's, let's transition into, into PVA, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. You know, again, you know, Serge, we know Serge's story and everything, but tell us about what you've seen, you know, the evolution of PVA and his, you know, did, did do you recall ever him coming to you about like, hey, I want to start this or ever having mm -hmm. a conversation with you? Can you tell us a little bit about those those beginning stages that you've had with Serge and those conversations that he shared with you? Yeah, I vividly remember being with him through the beginning of it when he was just kind of like thinking through this idea. And at first, um, it would be us just kind of like going to a bar together um, to watch the game, right? And then he'd be like, oh, well, I'm inviting so-and-so buddy. And I'd be like, okay, yeah, like, let's go. And this was before they had kids. So it'd be me, him, his wife, Liz, who I'm sure you guys know as well. And then he would invite like a few buddies. And then he'd be like, oh, well, you know what? I actually met a bar owner here at this place. And he said that he could like reserve um, one of the TV screens for us and, you know, a few tables in that area so that we can, um, us go watch the game and then invite a few more people. And so it kind of just, kept growing from there. And then he's like, you know what, like, let's make this into like a thing into a real like 
org um, organization that kind of like does this more regularly and maybe does it a little more organized instead of, you know, just using the old uh, uh, phone line to like call up people or text people and, and invite them out last minute to watch the game together. And so I slowly he started getting more organized and kind of like started like visualizing what he wanted to do. And he's like, well, you know, he got it set up. And so we would, you know, it was basically like us still going to bars together, still going to watch the games. And then he's like, well, what if we just like went to an actual game? Like, what if we just would go? And so I went to one of the games with him in Houston, right after my sister-in-law had her baby, like literally a week after she had the baby. And uh, I don't know how he managed to get permission. Um, and we drove the three hours to Houston and we went to a game there. And uh, I, I think that was the first game, if I'm not mistaken, that he had like really arranged for, you know, Pancho Villa, at that time, a much smaller group, Pancho Villa uh, fans to come out to the game together. And there was like a tailgate at the beginning and, you know, there was someone with like the payaso wig and we saw a chapulín and there was actually a guy dressed with like the Pancho Villa um, like artillery that he always wore. And um, so that was like the first game, if I remember correctly, that was the first game that he had arranged to like get us in a section and get us tickets and everything for the whole like Pancho Villa fandom. Not to interrupt you, but it was that that was a game that you guys put little mini flags on each seat, right? Or was that the stadium that did that? I think that was the stadium who did that. Him and I had walked in early to take um, the banner and right. two of the drums. And so we did do that for the um, for the rest of the group that was still tailgating because it was only like the stadium only gave permission to like two, three people from the org to go in and like kind of help set up. But I think the flags were already there, if okay. I'm not mistaken. But I know exactly which game you're talking. So continue. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so then it's just like a grown into this massive thing. And I feel like I missed sort of like the middle of it, right? Because I was focusing on my own career and I wasn't in Austin anymore with him and, and the family. And um, and like to see everything that it is now, it's it's incredible. And to see that it's like got this huge following. And like you said, it's very family oriented because that's that's when it started. It was like right after him and Liz had gotten married and then, you know, started building up as their first baby was born. And, you know, I even remember when we went to the Arizona game, we had my nephew with us and he was not even a year old at that point. He was, I think, 10 months old. And we called him El Talisman de, de Mexico. He had his little green Mexico jersey on, like official little green Mexico jersey on. I think they only made it for like size 2t and he was not even a year old so we like tucked it in and we made it fit him and um and yeah he was there in the stadium in his little baby carrier and we had those uh, those like noise canceling headphones on him because he was napping um but yeah it's it is a it's a family thing and it's a way to also like carry our culture uh because i mean we all grew up watching the games uh with our parents like i remember like you know on sundays you just put soccer on, whether it's Mexico or Liga MX, like you just have the games on right over the weekend and you have a carne asada going in the backyard. And so it's just, it's a family thing. And I think that's really what he wanted to see, you know, outside of the bars and outside of those like watch, watch parties, he wanted to see like a family way to keep celebrating the team. Nice. That, that's crazy. I mean, and to, to do everything that he does, right. And to still watch this grow i mean you're probably i mean i'm still taken back on how <laughs> it's actually gotten and what we've been able to accomplish right that's, that's yeah. cool. yeah, Claudia, are you are yeah. you surprised uh to, to, you know how quickly this evolved over the years or did you kind of see like you know what when when my brother has something in mind it's gonna it's gonna grow like did you know tell us about your thought did you think like eh, this is a phase you know that's fine maybe him getting with friends or did you really think like oh my gosh, like he's got something going here. Like he's just, he's going to make something out of this. I don't think any of us as outsiders could have visualized what he had visualized. Um, Cause he would always like say like, oh, well I want to do this next or I want to try this next. And then we'd be like, uh, okay. Like we couldn't visualize it like he could. And now he's got like plans for the world cup and he's made trips for the gold cup here in North America. And so it's like, he could visualize it, but the rest of us were kind of like, huh? Like, I don't know if we were just slow or like, just couldn't like capture what he was visualizing. Um, 
but yeah, I, and you say that it was like fast, but it wasn't fast. I mean, this has been years in the making. And I think he's, he's had this like idea for a long time, even longer than I could recall. But I think he finally started um, speaking up about the idea and sort of bringing it up out loud, like saying the idea out loud. I think that was like early 2010 um, era. And so that's like 10 years now, but I think he's had the idea much longer than that. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. It always starts with the, with the dream, with the vision and then yeah. kind of goes from there. And you know what, it, Coronel, I don't know, but we have, you know, some stuff coming up too, right? I mean, there's um, a game coming up at end of May and Absolutely. then of course we're preparing for the, the gold cup, right? So, you know, what, what do we have in plan there, Coronel? What, what can you share with us so far? Well, uh, nothing's actually confirmed yet as far as like tailgating and pregame and after activities. We're working on that right now. But the game was originally supposed to be May 30th on a Sunday. It got pushed forward, it pushed up. So it's actually on Saturday, uh, the 29th. It's going to be in Dallas. And then shortly after that, the following week, we've got CONCACAF Champions League games in Denver. So semis and final in Denver. So we got the Denver games coming up right after that. And then they announced the Gold Cup venues, right? And you know, one one of our one of our members out here in, in Phoenix uh, tweeted, they should just rename it Copa Tejas. <laughs> because, <laughs> because the stadiums, the locations, I mean, I'm gonna read off the locations for this Gold Cup yeah. the venues, right? So it's gonna be AT&T Stadium in Arlington, the BBVA in Houston, Cotton Bowl in Dallas, NRG in Houston, the Q2 Stadium in Austin, and Toyota Stadium in Frisco. And not to mention Glendale, Orlando, and Kansas City are the only other three cities. So it's technically all Texas-based. Well, and even three of those stadiums are within the DFW Dallas-Fort Worth area. So, I mean, because you've got Frisco, Arlington, and then Dallas. And Arlington and Frisco are technically suburbs, uh, you could say, of Dallas-Fort Worth. Wow. So, what do you think about what do you, well, first of all, let me ask you guys, what do you think about the venues and the cities that they've chosen? I mean, we obviously know because of pandemic reasons mm -hmm. and what's going on. Like, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, we'll start, yeah, Claudia. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, we obviously have the fandom here in Texas and the fact that they have won uh, a game in Austin, I think will also be a great way to kind of inaugurate the Austin Stadium into this like international Mexican fandom that we have here that we know exists here in Texas and especially here in Austin. Uh, so that'll be a great like international introductory game for the Austin Stadium. And I'm really excited for it. I know they'll have Austin FC games before that. But you know, this Gold Cup match, I think, is going to be really great. That's awesome. Are you are you going to go to any of those games? Being that they're I'm I'm trying to. Uh, well, I'll be actually in DC by the time the Gold Cup starts. But for the Dallas game in May, I will be there. Y les digo, I'm very nervous because it's the first match I take a boyfriend to, oh. and so I'm like, my brother's already like on high alert. Uh, so, <laughs> and I'm sure you guys are going to be there too, supervising, chaperoning. Uh, Hola, Claudia. Is this the one that? Hold on, let me just show this for kids. Is this the one that did this really quick? Is a is a tweet that your brother posted. And he goes, "When some rando sends flowers to your house for your sister, yeah, about to yeah, throw in the trash." <laughs> yep, yeah. So right now, because of the pandemic, I'm staying with family because I didn't want to have to work in DC alone and be away from everyone. So my brother, thankfully, like let me crash in like uh, his spare apartment, and. Uh, so like the address that I use for mailing or for anything is this address. Like if I need something immediate or whatever, if I'm ordering like my Jersey, you know, I have it mailed to my brother's house. And so the flowers <laughs> arrived to the house and they were not for my sister-in-law, obviously, because my brother would have been the one to order them. They were for me. And so, yeah, my brother uh, like wanted to toss them out. I was lucky enough I saved them before he did. But uh, yeah, that's, that's Sergio. That's big brother Sergio for y'all. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So I'm willing to bet. I think so. Basically, what we're gonna end up doing is taking a picture, me, your boyfriend, and we so and search. I'm <laughs> yeah. gonna make it. I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to put the money down that Claudia's not gonna make the Dallas game. <laughs> I will make the May Dallas game. I don't know if I'll make the Gold Cup games, but I will try. <laughs> <laughs> so 
going back to the venues they're going to, uh, I think it actually, um, it, it's actually in, in Mexico's favor, dude. They're all, you know, kind of the south, like southwest area. Uh, that favors the selección. Always, you know, no matter, no matter what, anywhere in the U.S., we're always, we're always home, right? But I think just the fact that we're closer to the border towns and in the areas, this this benefits Mexico big time, 100. percent You know, well, we don't see we don't see Columbus, we don't see all these other venues that the U.S. supposedly said their home home court advantage. You know what? That's even been taken away. So I think that's huge. I love that. Definitely. But one thing that we got to remember, guys, is we don't know exactly where they're going to play. So these yeah. are venues, you know. I was talking to Jaime earlier from Kansas City, and he goes, I go, hey, are you excited? You, you, you're getting a Gold Cup game. He's like, yeah, it's probably like, you know, Bermuda and... and, and Bahama, <laughs> Pretty Mama, yeah. Yeah, so he's like, <laughs> you know, some random team that, you know, we don't want. But you never know. They might, you know, I don't know if maybe because depending if, if these stadiums are open fully, you know, oh. maybe, maybe, maybe that's where they're going to play. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But then not only that, see, we've got... The Olympic Games coming up, Tokyo, and then we've not, I mean, obviously the time zone and all of that good stuff, but then you've also, then you got to get into uh, World Cup qualifiers. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a busy year for Mexico and for us. I mean, I'm not, there's no, there's absolutely no way I'm going to travel to all those games. There's, there's, there's absolutely physically no way, unless Claudia wants to pay for them. I, I mean, my piggy bank broke a while ago, so I don't know either if I can help. Yeah, so I mean, we're, I'm we'll happy have to, to do a GoFundMe for a Coronel because <laughs> he's in all the venues. But, yeah, but Coronel, you have to take the vaccine, bro. I mean, we have to protect you. You're in that that danger zone. We have to protect you. I'm you not taking the vaccine. I'm actually, <gasps> what? I'm actually trying to find like a nurse friend or somebody that works in the medical field that can give me just a card so I can forge. <gasps> Oh, it, there is that a, it, is not okay. You have to get vaccinated. I, 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 my second one, and I'm fine, dude. I'm. It's okay. You'll be okay. I'm okay. What, what is the fear of it? Let's let's dispel your your false fears. What what's going on? I just don't trust it. Why? I don't, I don't trust it. Why? What, what don't you trust about it? The fact that medical professionals who have been in the research field for their entire careers came up with it, or like what what is it that you don't trust? Yes, in a short amount of time. Because there's such a huge field of people you can test because the virus was so rampant, they had such a huge pool that was so immediately accessible to test the vaccine on. Yeah, that's why it's not yeah. like other uh, like chicken pox, you know, when like it's not like there was a rampant pandemic where they could easily pool subjects to test on mm -hmm. the, the COVID vaccine was tested on people that were being easily that were being exposed because the the virus was so rampant all around the world so they had an easy access to a sample group to test it on yeah and to do the trials on that's why it was so fast and thank god it was so fast because now the pandemic i mean you know knock on wood we're almost through it and it lasted over uh, just over a year already how many people have been taking it and you haven't especially the pfizer and the moderna right i took the mm -hmm. pfizer you know, I think the Pfizer seeing, as well. Yeah, you're not seeing a lot of these negative effects going on. I mean, look how many already have taken it. So oh, I mean, that right now, short term, but a lot. But also, I mean, like long. What, what long term uh, fears do you have? What, like, are you are you still planning to have babies? I don't understand. Like, what what are these long term fears? The whole, uh, your own, uh, That's the, I don't know. I don't know. Let but, me show y'all what I did. I'm so excited about getting the vaccine. I actually bought this today. Don't judge me because the price tag is still on it. <laughs> but I did this today with oh, my, my vaccine card to have a little frame because I am so excited that I'm vaccinated because when you look at the number of people that are dying, that have died, especially in the U.S., it is people of color. We are dying at much higher rates than white people and there's actually also a study out that white people are still getting the vaccine at higher rates than those more vulnerable of dying of, of COVID. And then there was also another study that showed white people are also least likely to wear a mask in public, which is one of the simplest things you can do to protect yourself uh, from COVID. Yeah, I think that... I think that's because we're just afraid, man. I do. We just don't believe anything. I don't believe. Right, anything. I'm gonna do this. I'm but gonna, why? I'm, this. I just don't. I just. Coronet, I am gonna do this, Coronet. I'm going to convert to Apple, if yeah. you if you take it. You will you convert to Apple? I, I will. If you get the vaccine and not I, just a fake I, card. I, 
upgraded I'm, to the newer the, the newer device, and I'm willing, dude. This is it's probably gonna cost me some money, but I am so I care, I care about you so much that I'm willing, and this is hard for me because you know, how long have I been fighting this? Yeah. Uh, um, that I'm willing to, and but you have to do it. Don't be doing all that shady stuff. That was it. Uh, uh, you have to go with him and make sure he gets vaccinated. I want live video yeah, of this. That's when I put on it because I know him. I know he he knows people because I mean, look at look how much he's trying to convince me. I mean, I have a video uh, a recording here of him trying to convince me going to Apple. Hold on. Uh, bro, you really, really need to get an iPhone. Because it takes forever. I gotta look for you on WhatsApp. Bro. All right. Dude, are you willing to take the bet? Because uh-huh. I don't know if I don't know if it's a whiskey talking. I'm done. Maybe I'm I'm delusional here, here but I, I do care about you. Here's the thing. So like when they were when they were talking about obviously you gotta wash your hands and all that stuff. Do you you really honestly wanna know the first thought that entered my mind? What did they put in the water? Is the first thought in when they start saying, wash your hands. Okay. And I'm thinking, what did they put in the water? And then when they said you gotta wear your mask, I'm like, who who made the mask? What what's what's in the what's in the material? Like that's, what's in like that's just me, man. It's just the way I am. I grew up like that. I don't know. But then what about hand sanitizer? You think they got into every single company of hand sanitizer across the country and into the water of everyone across the world? Because this isn't just in the US, this is the entire world. Yeah. All governments across every border are saying, you know, wash your hands because they're following the advice of medical professionals who have studied viruses, who have studied pandemics, who yeah. have dedicated their life, their career to this. And then we have people like a coronel who are just like using old wives' tales to like scare them of but, getting the vaccine. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna play <laughs> devil's advocate here because I think uh, I know coronel, coronel. I know what's going on here too because a lot of times, you know what, our culture and community have always been, you know, received the back, the 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 tail end or the back end of a lot of things, right? You know, we we we've, we've had a history of us being treated or, or being misused or mistreated, right? Mm-hmm. We, the lack of trust is there. I mean, that's that's it. But you know, we need to we need to kind of get away from that too, right? We can't because if we constantly do that, we're going to be held back, right? We have to start doing our own research. We have to stop listening to you know el tío sotano and, and tía lala or tía uh, la trailera. El it, Facebook no el, cuenta no, tampoco. Stop, stop listening to those voices because, dude, honestly, my barber is always talking these conspiracy theories, and I'm always like, bro, like, <laughs> like, thank you, but no, you know that is. Where'd yeah. you find that, you know? Uh, and, and it's like you got we got to do our own research. We got to be educated and we got to, you know, we got to we got to look for us ourselves instead of listening to our neighbor at the bar. Right, Adrian. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, but I mean, I told like you're you're not the only right. This is, there's huge mistrust across our culture, across POC cultures, because there is a history in this country of using us um, specifically to test medical practices, test medicines. Like, I mean, look at the women of Puerto Rico, they were used, um, to test birth control a lot and they had no idea that they were going to be infertile because they were the testing sample, right? They, they were unknowingly and unwillingly the testing sample to test out uh, a birth control. And so like, I definitely understand that the mistrust is there and everything, but I think we're at a point, um, where this pandemic has impacted so many people taking so many lives, especially our own community. And with that, you know, you start erasing our, our our possibility of carrying on our cultures when you start erasing, you know, the elders in our families who have passed away and who can no longer tell us their stories yeah. or didn't get a chance to tell us their stories. And, you know, it's not just here in the US, it's all across the world. So I think that also helps me fight off some of the like mistrust issues. Cause I'm like, okay, well, there's no way that somehow the entire world and all the all the governments across the world decided and finally agreed on one thing, and that's to give the people of this world COVID nineteen. Like, there's no way all the governments came together to do that, right? They can't even agree at the UN for anything. Like, <laughs> they can't even agree to feed the like hungry children. How are they going to agree to like finally do something? And they choose to the spread COVID nineteen to everyone. Like, so you know, like it's just. You look at what everyone is doing all around the world and how different countries are, are handling COVID-19. And you look at examples like New Zealand and Australia and you're like, oh, well, it, looks like, it looks really nice out there. And, you know, they have the vaccine. They've been able to keep COVID numbers down. They've had like minimal deaths. So 
you, I don't know. I think it's always good to get like more news sources, especially internationally. Like I love um, watching and reading BBC. Yeah, yeah, that's so, my news source right there. Yeah. So yeah. You know, this is the uh, oh my gosh, Claudia, we can talk on for hours. This is what <laughs> I love about this is what I love about what we do here in in BS Podcast, right? We're not here. It's not all about soccer and giving you the latest scores and all that. You can get that in so many outlets. This is for us to give our voice, share our opinions, um, share your story. And Claudia, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, you know, we hear so much of, of 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 your brother and his story, but it's cool to hear now somebody within his circle and kind of seeing how this got started from your perspective. And this is really awesome. But more than anything, thank you for sharing your voice um, and speaking up for our community uh, and being a part of that and making that difference. So uh, we like to just close out with any final thoughts. So Claudia, any final thoughts, any shout outs, anything you want to tell us that you're working on as we wrap up? No, just thank you so much for inviting me. I love getting the chance to mix a little sports and politics. That's always a good route. Uh, I know some people don't like it, but I love the opportunity to do that. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Claudia. And Coronel, any final thoughts? Uh, anything you want to shout out to? Uh, I don't know, man. Claudia made a good, good argument for the vaccine. So, you know, I'm thinking about it. Fonzo did the other day at your birthday party. He, you know, I was getting a lecture in the backyard, too, if you were there, see. So he had a good argument as well. Um, I don't know. But for right now, AMLO abrazos. That's what I'm going to do right now. Put up my <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. But you had a good argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Yeah, Claudia. You know what? You know. Joining us. Hopefully, we see you uh, in Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. And again, love. I mean, I've known you for a very long time, uh, and I'm very, very proud of what you've been able to accomplish and what you're doing and, and standing up for yourself and and us standing up for the community. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, it's always it's always about the community. You know, I may just have experienced a certain thing, but I know in our community those experiences are way too common. And so we just, we need to stand up for our community as a whole in general. So yeah, again, Gordon, thank you. You know, it's nothing, it's coming from love, you know, it's coming from love. And again, and there's no pressure. We want you to make your own decision, but we, like, you know, Claudia, myself and many others, uh, we want us to start, you know, seeking out the truth for ourselves, right? And, and, and helping each other out uncover that. Um, so nothing but love, Coronel. You definitely, but at the same time, you know, a hug is gonna come once we know you're taking it. Because if not, then we're gonna give you like fist bumps oh. or maybe kind of, kind of do the, do the old what's up from far away. <laughs> uh, but from from Austin, Texas, all the way here from Phoenix, Arizona, from all across all of our different battalions and cities, Coronel, Claudia, Sargento, thank you again. Signing off. Hasta la próxima, amigos. Estrella difícil para terminar y la banda norteño nos empezamos Son las 3 de la mañana y no paramos La cerveza en la hielera la sinfriamos Y aunque lleguen los azules nosotros uh, no, no, The audio was great, so we're good uh, Coronel, uh, I think you're good Still, You haven't done anything different, you're doing the same thing as always, right? Correct You're not trying nothing, You're not trying something new on me today that I don't know about oh, I showered, but I mean <laughs> Que milagro Gracias Bye,